Hello and welcome to another episode of the Self Made Podcast. On this episode of the show, I welcome Chris Bavin onto the show. I met Chris a few years ago when I had the pleasure of being on Food Truth or Scare on the BBC whilst he was presenting that show. It was very amazing to see him in his element, being a real natural presenter and really put me at ease. Since then, I've followed his work closely from many other health shows, including Eat Right for Less, and working with some people like Gloria Honeyford, Mary Berry, Dara Breen, amongst many, many, many others. But what you might not know is this guy comes from a very hard-working background, working the importation of flowers and fruit and veg, going into his own greengrocers and retail company and the successes and the struggles that that faced, also succeeding in this world of television with some amazingly big personalities and now going more into the health market having his second book releasing soon called The Fake Away where he takes some of our most popular takeaways and makes them healthier and quicker to eat. In this show named Fake It Till You Make It we talk about that book. We talk about the importance of cooking, why it's important to teach your children to cook and why it's important to eat together as a family. We talk about some of the issues facing health today, the psychology of health and why that is probably more important than what we actually eat and how we make cooking accessible. We also talk about his rise into television, how he dealt with imposter syndrome, nerves and how these things aren't always bad things in your career. We talk about some of the lessons he's learned in terms of interviewing and conversation as well as some of the lessons he has learned from people he has worked with in the years and why it's important to just to be a good person and give back. Chris is a really really nice guy and it's really really warm and open and honest interview and I think you'll get a lot from it. So if you enjoy the show, please share on social media tagging myself and Chris and please give a five star review on whatever your preferred podcast platform is. And if you really enjoyed the show and want to help us support us do a lot more of it, go to the buy me a coffee link in the description below and please donate whatever you can. Also, if you want to improve your cooking skills and at the same time create some really nice recipes at the same time, go and buy a copy of Chris's book. It really is phenomenal. There's so many good stuff in there. So without further ado, I'll leave you with myself and Chris Bavin. So Chris, this is a very interesting episode because I met you a few years ago on a random experience where I ended up somehow on the BBC through a mate of mine. But for people who don't know who Chris Bavin is that maybe don't have the BBC in their households, Tell us a little bit about who you are. Okay, so uh, it's not the most exciting story, I'm afraid, but um, yeah, my name's Chris Bavin. I have worked in the fresh produce industry my whole life. Well, first of all, I started out in the horticultural industry. So I started importing flowers from around the world and selling to the, the wholesale markets. I wasn't particularly academic at school. I didn't have a, a, a really sort of clear, well, I don't know, if many people do, but I certainly didn't have a very clear idea of, of what I wanted to do or, or you know, the career that, that I would sort of follow. Um, so I left school at, at 16 and I just found a job in, in the back of a local newspaper, which is how we used to find jobs pre-internet. Um, in, this was in 1996 and, and I applied for a job for a junior flower trader um turned up knew nothing about flowers knew nothing about the the world of of importing or perishable goods or or the wholesale markets or anything like that um and i was offered the job and then my boss mike dodds who you know it, it was a great guy and and you know i'm always grateful for him taking that chance on me said look the wholesale market is a very unusual place it's a very antiquated place it's a it's a very unique um place to sell into the wholesale market, you've got to really have an understanding of it. So they sent me into Western International Wholesale Market to work, you know, three o'clock in the morning, cutting, standing flowers, putting them in buckets, doing, you know, all these sorts of bits and pieces. And from the very first moment I walked into to a wholesale market, I just fell in love with it. You know, it's they're they're noisy, they're vibrant, they're they're hustle, they're bustle, they're they're incredible places, you know, for someone that's never been to a wholesale market, they operate at night. So these places are, you know, enormous sort of warehouses or, or hangars, if you like, with lots of, of businesses within it. Um, they supply. So in, in the flowers, they would supply florists and street traders and, and places like that. In the fruit and veg wholesale markets, they will supply 
greengrocers, street traders, restaurants, all of those sorts of places, catering companies. Um, they operate at night. They're, they're just, just an electric, vibrant, amazing place, you know, with some real characters, um, lots of banter, lots of laughter, lots of joking, you know, and, and it, this, this environment, although completely alien to me was just, you know, I sort of, and it sounds a bit of a cliche and a, and a bit, sort of, I don't know, a, a, a bit romantic, but I, I instantly felt at, felt at home and just thought, wow. And for the first time in my life, I sort of thought, wow, this is, this is something I could, could do. And, and, you, and it's a real, you know, there's lots of, you know, rags to, not rags to riches, but lots of people that have come from sort of, you know, fairly humble backgrounds have gone on to become very successful you know it's a it's not an industry of of you know what qualifications have you got or what university have you got or or you know who your parents are or whatever you know it really is a if you're prepared to apply yourself if you're prepared to work hard enough if you've got a bit of something about you you could succeed in this environment and and I just loved it absolutely loved it and then so I worked in this industry and and did well um for maybe three four five years um and someone said to me, look, the flower industry is great, but if you want to continue growing at the rate you are, you might want to look at taking a side step into the world of fruit and veg. Because, you know, if the flower industry is worth a couple of billion pounds a year in the UK, the fruit and veg industry, you can times that by 100. You know, it's it's astronomical. It's, you know, it's almost exhaustive. It's, it's unlimited. You know, there's no limits to it. Um, so then I did that, but there's lots of synergies, you know, selling fresh cut flowers are very similar to selling fruit and veg because, you know, it's perishable, it's, it's chilled, it's sold through the same business model, the same markets, the same sort of people. So there's lots of synergies there. So, um, I took a side step into, into fruit and veg and, and again, just, you know, loved it, uh, did quite well and and still remain in that industry to this day so that's been about 20 something odd years um may, well maybe even tw- maybe you know god blimey to maybe 25 years now um and i still love it i still have lots of friends in the business i still work occasionally in the industry um and whilst i was on that journey of of you know working in the fruit and veg market all i was hearing from my customer base was the green grocers were dying out um so that's my customer's customer if you like and that sort of didn't make sense to me because i thought you know a good green grocer should be doing well you know i and i, and I sort of felt that you know we wouldn't go to get our car fixed from anywhere other than a than a the qualified mechanic in a garage why would you buy your fruit and veg from anyone that isn't a specialist fruit and veg person mm. um so then in 2009, I just thought I'm going to open a green grocers just to see like why these, you know, why this business is being um, squeezed as much as it is. And, uh, and yeah, in 2009, we opened the Naked Grocer, which was one of the first zero plastic, uh, zero waste, environmentally conscious, environmentally friendly shops. You know, they're, they're quite common now. You know, you have these real refill shops and, and zero plastic shops. Um, but they weren't as common then, and there wasn't many, if any, really out there. So we opened that, and the Naked Grocer was that. It was, you know, as nature intended, you know, without any of that additional packaging and 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 plastic. So that's where the the term the Naked Grocer came from. And that's the and business you opened with your with your other half. Yes, yeah, absolutely, with my wife. Yep, yeah. um, and it was brilliant. We had it for. Uh, eight nine years and 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 I loved every minute of it. It was fabulous. It was a real steep learning curve. You know, I learned more as a as a as a green grocer. I learned more about fruit and veg than I had you know for many many more years as an importer. You know, having the customers in front of you and the product in your hand um, was was a real eye opener and and fascinating. And we won a couple of awards. So we won best green grocer of the you know an independent retailer of the UK and. Uh, and from that, we were approached by a TV company, by a, a production company. Um, I got a phone call one day out of the blue and, and you know, I'd never even considered being on telly, not for a split second, not once, not ever. Um, that was something that just wasn't, it just didn't feel that that would ever be possible or, or something that could ever happen. So 
I think if you asked a child now or a younger person now, you know, maybe they want to be a vlogger or a blogger or a YouTuber or, you know, a, an influencer or, or work on telly. But, you know, for me, you know, being born in the 80s, that that was something that, that, that never seemed possible or plausible. So it never crossed my mind. Um, and one day my phone rings and and this lady introduces herself as, as working for, for RDF television. And have I ever thought about being on telly? And I, I can honestly say hand on heart. I said, no. Uh, and they said, well, well look, we, we think you're great. Would you like to, to, to try? And I said, well, listen, not really. I mean, I was working a hundred hours a week. I had two jobs. I was working as an importer and as the, uh, and I have the retail business. And I thought, you know, maybe I'd get like 50 quid and, and then, you know, and it would be, you know, a, a, something I'd do for a couple of weeks and then that would be it. You know, I never once dreamt it would it would lead to a career. Um, but luckily they persevered and said, no, look, we want to make this show. We want you in it. Like, let's do it. And we went to the market. We went to New Covent Garden Market. We did like a sizzler tape or a taster tape, which is just a bit of a like a, you know, just an example of what you might do, basically. Um, and then, yeah, the, they they sent that to the BBC and they they liked it and said, yeah, like make it. And that was that was Eat Well for Less, and that was nine odd years ago. Uh, mm. And we've just finished series series eight or nine, um, and it and it does really well. And and that sort of put me in that sphere of of food on telly. And and then from that you know, you become a bit more aware of nutrition, uh, certainly more aware of cooking and, and the challenges that families are facing and stuff. And now you, I've sort of moved myself into a space where I, I do some, some TV programs about food, food consumer, um, cooking shows and, th- and this sort of stuff. So yeah, it's been a bit of a whirlwind and, and it's something that you still sort of pinch yourself and think this is a bit bonkers really. Like how have I, how has this happened? You know, yeah. but, but brilliant. And, and I'm grateful, you know, will ever, will always be grateful for it. Going, going back to the, the to transition from the, the importing business into, into the retail market, the green growth. So you mentioned about that being such a lucrative industry to be in. Yeah, going into a high street business is, especially going into business with your wife, which, which and any person would try and advise you to go out going into business with your other half, is a massive, massive gamble and a massive risk. What is it that made you take such a gamble into going into something potentially so much smaller that when you had something that was very, you know, you moved into fruit and veg because you wanted to grow and then you took this riskier sidestep? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was foolhardy. I mean, my, my parents you know, took a mortgage out on their house to, 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 to lend me the money to, to start up. I mean, I, my, my ambition that, that I, that I never realized, unfortunately was to, to open a chain, you know, that was always my goal, you know, to start with one, roll it out to become a a prominent, uh, you know, force on the high street to sort of turn back the clock to, to, put green grocers back on the map to change people's shopping habits to to try and negate the environmental impact our food is having and and I, I had big plans and big ambitions and 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 like many things life gets in the way you know it's you become so bogged down with the day to day like I say I was running a, 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 I was running a, a, a decent sized retail business but but only one it had other facets to the business you know we had a a a veg box business we had a small catering business um and a small flower shop but but ultimately it was in in essence just one retail business and I was working 100 hours a week regularly seven days a week six and a half days a week didn't have a holiday for for a few years was uh was still involved in the importing of, of fruit and veg and still doing that as well and then the, the the emerging TV career, and I was being pulled in in three different directions, and and it was pretty unsustainable. It wasn't great for me. My my sort of health not significantly deteriorated, but you know I put on weight, and I wasn't looking after myself, and and wasn't sleeping a lot, and and wasn't doing anything for me, and you know so, and then I had a, a we had our first child, and then you've got to just, you get to a point where you just think, right, okay, what, what am I doing here? You know, I'm, I'm doing three or four things badly. I, you know, I'm, I'm being, I'm not being a great husband. I'm not being a great father. I'm, I'm not being the best importer. I'm not being the best retailer. And I'm probably not being the best TV presenter because 
I'm trying to do too much. And then, and then it, you know, as, as is the way, you've got that decision. Do I go and employ someone really good who's going to cost me a lot of money to, to run this business in my absence? You know, although you've got to be aware that no one will run your business, no one will care as much as you, um, because why would they? Why should they? Um, so yeah, in the end, we had to take the the, the the very difficult decision to shut the the retail side. We kept the veg box business going for for a few years after that. But then even that, we sort of you know, if you've you've got to live these businesses, you know, you've got to be there every almost every minute of every day. And and if you're not there, you know, it doesn't run as well. And, and the you know the 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 service, the quality, you know, all these things that you really pride yourself on, can sometimes take um, take a bit of a hit. So. We took the decision to to, to close the business, um, but we retained all the IP and and the name and all of that. And and there is a, there is a, the very distinct possibility that one day we will revisit it. You know, I've got three young children, and when they get to a stage where they don't need me around as much, um, and I'm not as busy with the kids and stuff, then then it's something that I would definitely revisit. But yeah, you're right. It was it was a risk. Um, and there were times where it went, it was going very, very badly. Um, and there were times when it was going very, very well. But yeah, you know, the, the margins are very small. The 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 effort and input is is very high. And the high street, you know, is an expensive place to operate, you know. And, and we learned lots of very, very tough lessons, you know. I mean, if you sign a particularly long lease, you pay stamp duty on that, which was something I didn't know. Um, the way the rates are formulated, you know, if you have a... A, a, a really wide, uh, shallow shop, you pay extraordinarily higher business rates than if you have a, a, a slim, deeper shop. Um, you know, all these things were, you know, the, the, the cost of setting up a business, the, you know, the infrastructure, all of that, you know, was 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 extraordinary and it, it, but you still but i but i maintain a good business um can still make money a good business can still offer you know uh, something special you know and and have that point of difference and have that point of relevance um but it's a challenge and i would i would implore anyone going into it go into it with your eyes wide open and make sure you protect yourself and uh, and make sure you're you know, not committing yourself for too long a period, make sure you have lots of break clauses available to you. Um, and, and yeah, go, you know, because we, we all have this inbuilt thing where we, where if we want to do something, we make it work for us. You know, if you really want something, you'll turn a blind eye to lots of red flags and you'll, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll convince yourself that it will be okay. And that doesn't really matter. And, and, but, but I think, you know, you you have to to make sure, take a step back, you know, check it with some other people, maybe get an advisor or a mentor or, or you know, an impartial person to just go through everything with you and just make sure your 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 heart isn't leading your head, which which it certainly can in in those in those circumstances. Um, we we had a, a lot of really expensive lessons. I had one lesson where. Uh, we didn't change the lease because I had an agreement in in writing um, and in person, and and was done with a with a handshake, and and then that that became apparent that 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 wasn't legally binding, even though it was in writing. The the the, the lease hadn't been changed, and you know, that wouldn't stand up in a court of law. So be very aware in in the UK and and probably lots of other countries as well. You know that lease is is that is king that is so important and if that isn't changed it doesn't matter what else you know it doesn't matter if you've got it in writing in blood you know videoed whatever doesn't matter if the lease hasn't been changed then that that doesn't stand up so yeah lots of lots of lessons but but i you know looking back don't regret a minute of it loved it and and like i say we'll we'll hopefully one day be be back mm. i think it's i think it's an important lesson anyone can take from this about being pulled in different directions. And I'm certainly, certainly guilty of that. Of, I, I'm, I'm very much, a, it was Richard Branson's quote of when you get an opportunity, say yes and uh, you know, work out to do it later. And while I think that some of those opportunities have worked really well for me, it's, it's allowed me to get to Hong Kong, it, it allowed me to move to London, it gave me a lot of opportunities. But I, I also think sometimes I'm guilty of taking on more than I can handle. And, and like yourself, 
being in this position where you're pulled in several different directions. Did you see a, a big upshift in the quality of TV when you made that choice away from the retail business into the television stuff a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I did. Yeah, because I was because I was going into my jobs prepped. I was going into my jobs reasonably rested. I was going into my jobs fresher. Um, I didn't have the phone continually going. And listen, I've, I've never solely, solely, solely done the telly completely by itself. But even taking some of those layers away and now the projects that I do are projects that, that I can work alongside the TV. You know, I do some consultancy work. I do some project management. I do some various different bits and pieces still in the industry. Um, but I always now make sure that they can run alongside each other in a complementary way as opposed to a, a, a conflicted sort of way. So, you know, if I'm in, I'm in scum thought, you know, talking to someone or, or interviewing someone or doing something, my phone's going and one of the vans has been, you know, has been in an accident and someone hasn't turned up for work and this hasn't happened and, and this is a problem and that's happening and blah, blah, blah. You know, like you, you, your head's not where it should be. So, so yeah, I did notice a, a, an improvement. I mean, whether, whether for, from, from a viewer's perspective, they would notice or not, I don't know. I, I would probably imagine not, but certainly from my perspective, I was more, you know, present being present is, is is a terminology that's used a lot now you yeah. know and we use it for lots of different things you know be present be in the moment all of that and and i was more present you know after not being you know after you know streamlining my my responsibilities and taking some of those away i was more present in that in in the moment so in that sense there was an improvement for mm. sure so moving into the television stuff a little bit obviously this you said you'd never considered being on television this wasn't in your in your thought process at all and this is obviously a very intimidating thing for a lot of people you see a lot of people struggle with with making that transition like did you feel an element of like imposter syndrome or stage fright when you got in front of the camera or did the yeah. did it come naturally because you had that communication skills in the in the retail stuff i think a bit of both really i think there was an element of of uh, transferable skill set that I that I came with. You know, I I am a good communicator. I don't think that's you know conceited or arrogant to say. I, I think I am a good communicator um, because most of us are actually. In the, I, I'm not unique in that sense. You know, every if you take anybody from my industry, they are good communicators. Like I was about to is, say, do you think your industry helped you in the television front? Because you said at the start, this is very much a. There's a lot of lot of banter. There's a lot of communication. You, there's, it's, everything's going on. You sort of have to be heard in those situations. You you have to be heard and you have to listen. Uh, uh, and I think if if I, you know, listening is the the most important thing. I think that's um, that's that's critical. That's crucial. That's it, my, listening is in, is comes in front of talking. Obviously, I, I re, I'm aware there's a slight irony to that because I'm doing a lot of talking now. But um, but listening is 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 the key. I think. Um, yeah, we're all everybody in the fresh produce industry, everybody in the wholesale market, everybody in that world. Not everybody, but the majority are are fabulous communicators, mm. very good people. You know, very personable, very likable, very affable, uh, very agreeable. Um, this not to say that that business is is without conflict uh, in times. Of course, it is. You know, and we and we have to resolve those conflicts. But we work, you know. If I'm selling, if I, if I'm selling fruit or vegetables to someone, I'm talking to this person every day, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times a day. You know, because it's not like selling someone a car. You sell them a car, you don't see them for four, five, ten, fifteen years. You may never see them again. If I'm selling them a, a truck or a pallet of oranges, I'm going to speak to them again tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and sometimes. You know, there's challenges, you know, sometimes things aren't as good as you would have liked them to be or the market isn't as strong or the price doesn't seem right or whatever. There's a million variables within every transaction and you have to navigate those. And and everybody is a, a good communicator and, 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 and a big personality. So it's an industry of big personalities. So there was lots of transferable skills from the industry that I came from into into the new one, into into media. In terms of imposter syndrome, in terms of, of, of stage fright, in terms of, of you know, of being overwhelmed or, or feeling anxious about it, 100%, yes. I think that is true. It was true for me. 
I think is true of everybody. I think unless unless there is some real big disconnect, you must feel that. I think it's, or maybe that's not fair to say, but I would, I'm, and I know a lot of people in the industry, and I would say it's true of the majority. It may not be true of all, but it is true of the majority. I think we all have a sense of, but what, 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 why me? What I'm not, I, I mean, the, 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 the trap to fall in a lot is, you know, especially if I'm talking about, you know, if you look at the areas that I work in, I work in nutrition loosely. I work in food in terms of, of, of cooking and, and advising and, and shopping and, and in terms of consumer issues. If you look at any one of these things in isolation or even as a collective, there are people out there that are far more experienced, far more knowledgeable than I. That's 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 the fact of the matter. So there is always that, you know, I don't know enough. You know, people know more than me. You know, people are better than me. People why, you know, um, but but what you do is it's it's everything together, because if 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 you know everything, Maybe you can't relate to the person that doesn't know everything. So, so what I f- sort of found myself in a position where you—they call it in television—they call it an, in, an an informed curiosity. So, mm-hmm. you know enough to ask the right questions of an expert. You don't know too much that you can't ask these questions. You know enough that you can ask informed questions with a baseline of knowledge. But then if you're coming away from an expert and you're talking to somebody in the street, you can relate to them because you don't have all the answers. You might have a level of of information. You may have a reasonable baseline of knowledge, but you don't know everything. Mm -hmm. And so you can relate to the layman and you can relate to the expert and you find yourself in the middle there where actually you become the bridge, you become the conduit, you become the 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 sort of middle person between those two places which when you sort of realize that it all sort of makes sense and then you sort of become more at peace with it and i don't and you sort of then understand that i don't need to know everything Mm. i shouldn't necessarily even know because if you ever watch two experts talking it's different because they can't ask that it, it becomes very different or very difficult then to translate that into very simplistic, understandable terms, because nobody really wants to lower their level of knowledge. No one could be seen, neither could be seen to be asking the other one a question. So then it's basically two people talking at each other, maybe trying to, and then you they delve into levels of complexity that, that become, you know, they alienate the audience. So actually, you need someone like me or someone else that has a a good baseline of knowledge, an interest in that area, a desire to find out more, hmm. and then you can ask the questions. And and I've always, and, you know, I'm a big believer in when I, you know, I've, I've employed people over the years and worked with people and mentored people and all. There is no such thing as a stupid question. There is not. You know, and and I and I think that's really important. Maybe if you've asked the same question five, six, ten, fifteen times, then maybe you know there becomes a point where you should know. But in that first instance, there is no such thing as a stupid question. I and, suppose with the people who are watching your show, your job is to be the voice of them in these shows. And that stupid question, if you're thinking it, I guarantee you so many people in the nation are thinking it, and your job is then to ask it. Like you're you're very different to the experts as you're there to be the voice for us. And also, as you said, the bridge, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And that you're absolutely right. And that that is, and you know full well when you're talking to an expert or you're 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 you know in a factory or you're you're someone, you know, you know full well what everybody's sat at home because it, you know, you go, well, how or why or what about that? Or what does that do? Or what's this and why do I need that? And you know, it, it, it is the questions that everybody is asking at home, you know. Um, so that that is my job. So in that sense, that that alleviates some of that anxiety and that nervousness that, that you don't need to know everything. But but there's also another and nerves are interesting as well. You know, I I get I still get nervous, you know. I think and and uh, you know now as as a as a dad to to three children you know they they're going through their own 
things, you know, with the, 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 the school play or the, the, the trial for this or that. Um, and nerves are an interesting thing, actually, because I think they're really important. I think nerves are, they, they do a few things. One, they show you something's important, yeah. that it matters, that, it's, that it, it means something. You know, if you're not nervous about something, you know, there's almost an irony there that if I don't get nervous, I get nervous that I'm not nervous because actually, why am I not nervous about this? Like, does this not matter? Is this not the right thing? Do I not care about this? Because if I've got nerves, that that they're they're all the the indicators that I'm on the right path, that I'm doing something, that I'm that I'm moving forward, that I'm challenging myself, that I'm taking myself out of my comfort zone, that I'm progressing, that I'm you know. And so I so I sort of there is a comfort to the nerves in a way because it shows that I'm on the right track, um, and I think as long as you don't let them overpower you, you don't let them control you, uh, then I think they they are uh, they can be a they can be a, an ally, they can be a, 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 a they can be a, a benefit, they can be a strength in a way, um, and and your body is interesting as well because it can't really tell the difference between nervousness and excitement or fear and anxiety and and you know anticipation and and so actually they're very closely linked um and, and there's lots of things you can do about sort of trying to you know train yourself to to say no like i yeah i am nervous but actually i'm also excited you know a lot of what i'm feeling at the moment is excitement i'm excited because i've got the opportunity to speak to you know a thousand people in this room I actually i'm excited about that yeah of course there's nerves but but there's a level of excitement as well you know um and i think that and, and as soon as you get up there and as soon as you get into whatever it is you know you've just got to start you know you just start talking or start doing whatever it is you're doing it but but i think nerves you know nerves are, are prominent and 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 not without their role i think they've got a they, you know there's a benefit to them as well I, I i couldn't agree more that i've always said like when people ask about imposter syndrome i i've, I've got asked that. i've spent a lot of time mentoring trainers and then a, a bit of public speaking not to the like the degree that you have but and I, I get asked about that imposter syndrome a lot. And I, I always think like it's my if it wasn't for my imposter syndrome, I wouldn't keep progressing. My mm -hmm. my curiosity, like you said, in this, in, in my craft, is based on this level of imposter syndrome. If I thought I'd reached a pinnacle, I'd sit back and be comfortable. And it's that, okay, where is the gaps in my knowledge? I can go and find out, plug, or who can I speak to? What conversations can I have? And that's part of the reason why I love doing this medium of podcasting, because you just you meet people from very different, not only expertise, but just different backgrounds and different takes on the same thing. I've had about five or six different takes on imposter syndrome. And all the people I've known that have a whatever you call success, but a relative realm of success, come at it the same way in that it's not it's only a negative if you let it paralyze you, which is easily done, but it's just about trying to find and take those actions. I mean, you've said you've employed people. I don't know if this is within the retail business or whether it's in the TV world, but you must have worked with a lot of people that are brand new to this. I mean, you worked with me being brand new to it when I did that show. Um, like, have you had a situation where someone was paralyzed by it? And have you helped them through it? And if so, what advice would you give to somebody in that situation? Yeah, so... You, 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 yeah, I mean, I've not, I've never employed anyone in the in the in the media world because you know I'm, I'm just a freelance, you know, a self-employed freelance person. I get employed to do so, yeah. but 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 yeah, in in all my other walks of life, I I have. Um, but in terms of the media, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I have worked, I, I've filmed with everybody from from every single different part of the world you know and, and industry and, and levels of success and, and all of that and you know I could go and be filming with the chairman of a, of a billion pound business but in that moment they could be nervous they could be nervous for a whole host of reasons like what it, what what my shareholders going to make of this or you know my customer you know I've got very big clients that will be watching this I must you know they they've got some you know pressures from all different you know angles and stuff so there is the, you know there they, they could be a nervousness in anyone for different reasons you know everybody's level of expectation and, and potential consequences from something are, 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 are personal to to them but yeah, I have had people that, that that are very very nervous, and 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 some have, have sort of struggled to 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 get relaxed in, in in that environment. But so, as I said earlier, my one of my main jobs as a TV presenter is to listen, 
Um, mm. Which is really important. Actually, probably my most important role on that day is to make sure the whoever I'm talking to is at ease and they feel comfortable and happy. Um, so that's how I find that as my primary objective. And actually, I don't know, I don't know what I what it is. I don't have a real like hard and fast rule or template or you know do's and don'ts or or I don't have the answer really but but most people I I, I managed to make most people feel mm. relaxed and and calm and I, and I, that might be through a bit of self deprecation that might be just making the whole thing feel a bit irrelevant and ludicrous maybe you can you can find a way of of lightening that situation you know what i always say to people as well is uh, you know and it's not just i don't i don't just say this this is what lots of people say in that situation but it's look it's not live um we can start and stop as much as you like you, you know don't if you if you feel at any stage you don't know what to say or you don't want to answer just look at like so and and well, let me tell you, I'll tell you an anecdote, actually, that, that, that Greg Wallace said to me. So we were going on BBC Breakfast um, to promote Eat Well for Less. So the new series is coming out. And this is right. This is the series one. This is right in the beginning. Um, and Greg said, how are you feeling? I said, oh, I'm a bit nervous about this, to be honest. You know, he said, right, OK, well, look, what, what are you nervous about? I said, well, I don't know, really. I suppose what could go wrong? They asked me a question. I don't have the answer. And he said, fine. Well, that's, that's no problem. He said, look, if you, if they ask you something that you don't know the answer to, or you just, you know, your mind goes blank or whatever, just look at me and I'll start talking. And, and in that, you know, that made me feel a lot better. And subsequently I've been in a position where I've managed to do the same for younger, newer, less experienced presenters in the, in the same situation. And, and also, you've got to be aware that whoever's interviewing you, the pressure, the onus is on them for the conversation to flow. Like if if you if they ask you a question and you just clam up and they just look at you and you just look at them, the fault lies with the interviewer, not the interviewee. Um, it's their job to to change the question, to offer up an answer, to 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 take it in a new direction, to to ask something else, to to get you involved, to get you relaxed, to make you feel calm. Like so, and and that's that's true of when I'm interviewing or talking to someone on telly. You know, the onus is on me. That's just on so, me now, right? <laughs> yeah, that's just on me yeah, now. <laughs> it is. It, well, it is. You know, that yeah. is that is the 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 hierarchy of of yeah. of of responsibility. Yo. Know? Um, but in, in that situation, if I asked or now, if you ask me something that I'm not comfortable with and I'm clearly not comfortable, I clearly don't know, or, you know, I'd rather not talk about it or whatever, you know, it's your job to, to move that, to navigate it. Now, sometimes the, the challenge comes when you are trying to, and this doesn't really apply to me a lot because it's not really the area I work, but if you were on Newsnight, for example, or on the news and you are, you know, conducting a robust interview and you are, tr and, and the, the, the interviewee is trying not to answer. And then you've got to really double down and drill in and, you know, hold their feet to the fire, if you like, you know, or, 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 or hold, you know, keep, keep pushing that line of inquiry. Um, then yeah, then it then it's a completely different ballpark. But luckily, I don't really get involved in that too much because it's not the the, the space I work. But but I, I found over the years, most people with a bit of of love and a bit of care and a bit of consideration can, can will relax into yeah. it. And and you know, we always do the top at the you know a lot of the times. It's nice to do the the beginning at the end again, you know, just as they've got into their flow and they're relaxed and, you know, invariably 10, 15 minutes in it's, is fine. They're relaxed and stuff, but yeah, it's just about, you know, you just say, look, it's only telly. Don't worry about it. If I can do it, you can do it. Or, you know, John over there on the camera, like he can't read or write, like, don't worry. Like, or whatever, you know, you just make I remember it. you saying that to me when we were in my flat and read it. Well, that's it. Like you, 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 te you, te you tease it. You would make fun of yourself and you would tease, mm each other around and 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 that suddenly you just it just becomes less of a of a sort of 
yeah. uh, intimidating environment, you know. But but listen, it's still a big thing. Like someone holding a TV camera up and and uh, and or a microphone or whatever and asking you questions is will 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 always be a bit daunting and a little bit you know uh, nerve wracking. But but they they soon they soon dissipate in yeah. my experience. I, I, you, you're certainly right. How it's it's a it's a different realm. Like doing doing what you do is very it's it's, it's relatively light hearted t- TV, yes. right? whereas opposed to like like a news night show or something like that. And, and those things become re- I can imagine become really difficult interviews because by the nature of the interviewing and the questions and trying to get answers, you'll find the person will actually tighten up even more. I I watched recently. I don't know if you saw it. Um, the Die of a CEO podcast uh, with Matt no. Hancock and. I've never seen him feel so relaxed. And it's amazing that it took him being on the back benches to be able to answer some questions and relax. And it shows what those interview environments are like. And yes. I say different, different world, but I I can certainly vouch for, for for you know for working with you, you know, albeit only temporarily, how easy it was to get at ease. And I I found the whole the whole procedure of working on that show absolutely fascinating. I thought it was really, really, really interesting. Um but sort of like you mentioned the advice you give to other people, but you also mentioned you work with so many people from like, you mentioned Greg Wallace, you mentioned, you know, you got Gloria Honeyford you've worked with. Did I see you work with Dara Breen at one point as well? Yeah. Ma- yeah. Mary Berry, Claudia Winkleman, Angela Hartnett, uh, you know, some real, real big, big names, you know, and you, and you learn, you learn from them. I mean, I'm not, uh, Greg was the one that because he was the first person I worked with he he was quite instrumental in in offering advice and I would go to him for advice um and probably would still actually if I if I needed uh, he would be someone that I would call upon um in terms of the others you know I just, Gloria I learned a lot from because Gloria comes from a from a journalistic background mm. um and it was interesting when we worked on food truth or scare together that uh that you would get your scripts and you would go through them and and me being sort of fa- fairly inexperienced was certainly massively inexperienced by comparison i would just read my bits you know that they're the bits that i have to learn they're the bits that i'm going to be saying they, they they were the bits that i was focusing on actually and um and that's not nece- that's not necessarily wrong um but then Gloria said something to me and it and I realized that she's look she's reading the whole thing she's reading my bits she's reading her bits she's checking everything she's aware of absolutely everything and and that also comes into that listening thing that I said that that I was almost in that sort of tunnel of just do my bit like like Gloria knows her bit that's fine like I don't need to like that's not I just but she took a more holistic approached it and and understood because actually i did need to know her stuff because that was going to lead into mine or would have been led from me into that so for me not to have an understanding of that was actually a bit naive but but you know you've only got a finite period of time and you've got a lot of stuff to learn and and my my instinct was right get my bits right you know gloria will look after her bits i'll get my bits right but but actually you know she taught me that no you need to know everything you know you need to know it all because it's all relevant and it's all woven in. So, yeah. So I learned that from, from her as, and many other things as well. And I'm working with Claudia Winkleman, who for me is, is the best broadcaster on the face of the earth. She's amazing. Why do you say that? Just the way she does it. She's a, she's fabulously bright, like Hmm. fabulously bright, but, she can be quite deferential. She can be quite self-deprecating. She's very funny. She's very relaxed. And it's that balance of like super on something, but in a, in a really casual laid back way. Like she, she has that balance. So fabulous. She does it so well, but I, in my, in my opinion, better than anyone else bar none, you know, um, She's really, really good. And it was great, you know. I mean, but it's but it's very difficult to 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 watch her and think I you can learn, but there's such a natural, it's just such a natural talent that actually it's it's not like you go, oh, if I did X, Y, and Z, I would be better like she is. It's very hard to nail down what it is. It's very 
ethereal like it's in the you know it's it's this it's not something really tangible like so what i learned from gloria was something very tangible yeah. and something that i could i could easily apply to to the next day you know no problem like I, i've learned something now i can apply it when you work with claudia you know it's amazing you know you she's brilliant but you can't quite think what could i like how do i take that how do i apply that to to what because it's a very natural talent that she's got so but but again amazing and, and it's you know and everybody, Mary, you know, Mary Berry is 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 just a, you know not only a national treasure, and you can also learn things about being a, a good person as well from people. You know, mm. you might not necessarily take tips on being a better broadcaster, which you, which you can as well. But you can also take tips on on how to just be in that world and in that space, um, mm. because Mary and Gloria and you know they're so humble and they make so much time for everybody. And they're so just generous with their time and stuff. And I, I've always thought that that would come fairly naturally to me anyway, because I, 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 first of all, I'm not a big mega star anyway, but, but I'm also, you know, really a people person and, and, and I have come from fairly humble beginnings as well. So I feel that that would always be a natural thing for me, but great to see that, you know, actually, you know, that even the, if you do manage to climb, you know, up the ladder that, that, that you did that, how important it is to, to maintain those values that, that I've seen someone like Mary do, you know, Mary will always give you time. will always remember everybody's name. will always, you know, be, make herself available and, and, and be generous with her time as, as actually to be fair, most, if not all of everybody I've worked with. So yeah, it's interesting. You take bits and pieces and, and, and there's times where you, again, you know, I'll, I'll be sat in a green room with Angela Hartnett and Claudia Winkleman or Tom Kerridge or, you know, uh, Mary or, or, you know, Monty Don or, or, <laughs> and you just think like, wow, this is bonkers. You know, how am I sat here? And, and there is that bit of imposter syndrome that kicks in there as well. But, but actually, you all, you know, you're all people, aren't you? At the end of the day, you know, you, you break it down. It's we're, we're all pretty much the same. You know, you might have different interests and come from different places. And but yeah, you know, and and, and luckily, touch wood in my experience, everybody I've met has been, has been really nice and really lovely. So, yeah, I think I think it's it's it'd be, I think it's amazing how those things they do come back, though. Right. I think it's we, we it's a big world, but it's also a very small world. And you, so it's amazing that you know you you'll you'll hear stories very quickly that people that will give back and like little things. So like I'm I, I'm very honoured that you said yes to this podcast. Right? I've met you once in person prior to this, and little things like that will be remembered, and they'll be remembered. You know, if you do this on my show, you'll do this for other people in other facets of life, in the same way that other people will help you. Like going back to the Claudia thing, I think it's interesting about working with people that have a natural talent. You mentioned that she's like this this is untangible like naturalness to her. And I totally agree watching her. Does, does that sometimes make your job harder? Like I know I did a podcast with a guy called Jordan Shallow, who was a chiropractor and strength coach, really at the top of his game. And he's so into it to the point where he'll go off on a tangent in a story and I'll just get lost in it. And that point of like, this is where listening as much as the most important factor when doing an interview, sometimes it can be a detriment where I get lost in it so much. I get caught like, where am I going next? Do you find it sometimes it's hard to sort of like remember where you are and filter back when you get someone yeah. that's so yeah. unbelievably good? Yeah, absolutely. And you're you're right. But then, so it depends on what medium you're doing. So on something like this, it's absolutely fine. Get lost in it. You know, mm. dive in and completely immerse yourself. And if someone stops talking and you have to, you have to just take a minute to just process and collaborate, mm. uh, calibrate, sorry, and, and and sort of, you know, just digest. That's fine. But if you were on a live TV show, yeah. they're not listening. You know, and I remember the, the first time I, I sat on a live TV show was was quite unnerving. The, 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 they'll ask you a question on a two shot. And then as you start answering the question, the cameras will go to a to a single to, you know, mm. uh, just filming you. And at that point, the the, the interviewers are uh, right. They're looking at their next thing because they won't have that luxury of, right? Wow. Okay. Like, oh wow. Yeah. And then checking what to. So they're they're on the next thing. But with most mediums, I don't think that's a negative. I think get, yeah. like if you just go, wow. Okay. Woof. I wasn't expecting that. Or. 
that's it. That, like, I don't know where to start with that. Wow, you've covered so much there. And that, that's fine. And that's normal. And that's natural. And that's absolutely fine. So, I, yeah, I get. I absolutely get what you're saying, that sometimes there is an there's, it's a safety net. And I used to do it in the beginning. And the safety net was, what am I going to say next? I want to be ready. Mm-hmm. But actually, you don't need that safety net. Because I could, you you could have said something to me, and I go right, okay. He's just said that. Now I'm good. That would for me that leads on to that, or I'll ask that. And while I'm having this inner dialogue, you could have said the most groundbreaking, unbelievable, you know, thing. And I'm not quite there with it. And then I just go, yeah. So you mentioned this, da 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 da, da. and and uh, and arguably I've missed a more important, poignant point that you've made. Yeah. So, and, and Greg also gave me some advice on this. He said, trust yourself. You will have a question at the end. And even if you don't, you can just take a minute. Like, because we don't, we, because we, we're not doing live television primarily. Um, so it, that, so it, that's absolutely fine for you to just go, whoa, and then formulate your thoughts and, and process your thoughts. But I did in the beginning, for sure I did. I'm there, like. Right. What am I? You know, you're you're almost anticipating. You're preempting. You're 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 forward planning. And none of those things are bad. None of those things are wrong. But if you can just let go of that and trust yourself, that at the end of it, if something interesting has been said, or something noteworthy has been said, or something has you know of of, of interest has been said, you'll know. You'll have the you'll have the questions. You'll have that follow-up question because again because you're working in your area you have that informed curiosity you might not and and that might be your follow-up question could well be i don't understand that or could you can you could you explain that to me in a different way or could you summarize that for me or sometimes what you know what the, the 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 question isn't as an interviewer or as, as the presenter in, as you are in, in this instance, your question, and, uh, you know, don't say this the wrong way, but <laughs> your questions aren't the most important thing as, as my questions aren't the most important thing when I'm interviewing someone, the most important thing is the answer. Hmm. And sometimes your question could be, could you, could you elaborate on that? Could you, could you tell me a bit more about that or, how did you feel when that was happening or, or, or what did you, what did that mean to you or whatever? Like, so sometimes you're not even asking a question. You're just nudging yeah. or you're just, you're beckoning on a bit more. If you, you, you just, and sometimes your question is nothing. Sometimes your question is silence. And they, you know, like if you, you mentioned Joe Rogan at the top of this, I don't know whether it was before we, started recording or not but um you mentioned joe rogan i'm i'm not i'm i'm not a massive listener of joe rogan shows i i it depending on who his guest is would we'll, we'll determine whether i listen to his show or not um he interviewed elon musk and there was a big ferrari about it actually afterwards and the share price tanked and all of this uh, because i think they smoked on it or whatever but if you've ever listen to an Elon Musk interview. He's very considered. He's very slow in delivery. He's obviously a, you know, a fabulously, you know, like you know, off the chart, brilliantly bright and talented. But when he talks, he's slow and, and methodical and deliberate and and I thought when I heard Joe Rogan interview him, I thought, wow, you've done such an amazing job because he let, and podcast is a brilliant medium for this. Mm. And whether it was on a different medium, that may not have been able to, to happen. But he left Elon to do his thing. Mm. And, and that probably went against everything as an interviewer, as a, as a podcaster, as a broadcaster, as a presenter. You want to, right, let's go. Right, okay, so what, why, how, when, d- d- come, like you're chivying things along. He went the other way and he was just, sometimes he was just a, he just like, yeah, wow. Or right. And just letting go. And, and he, mm. and he just, so sometimes as an interviewer, 
doing nothing is the right thing. Saying nothing is the right thing. You know, so it's, yeah, it's just, it's horses for courses, but you'll feel it. You learn it. You just, you get an instinct because if some, some people, if you stop talking, they clam up, they, 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 they stop. They, they, they you know, they will wait for you to, to ask a question and others will go of, of their own accord. So it's just finding that balance and finding what works for, for different people and stuff. So, um, yeah, but but yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't get too bogged up in, in in worrying about your next thing or whatever, you know. But but it's common. It's that's yeah. not that's not uncommon and not and I will reiterate that's not wrong either. No. It's just I I remember early stages of doing doing this show. You know, I'm not a huge amount of episodes in, but you know, 60, 70 odd episodes in. And I remember the first time it was that I had this very long list of very specific questions next to me, and I was like almost get caught up in thinking what my next one is and it was only when I kind of went back to bullet points of like here's talking points I'll touch them in any order and you know there's so many episodes now where I've barely touched them like yeah. I've gone off in one way I had an idea for the show and I've had to change the title because we've gone off in a different way and there's some of the best episodes I've had and I and like you say about Rogan I love watching interviewers like um have you ever listened to Chris Williamson who does Modern Wisdom no I don't think so so he, he's a really fascinating interviewer. And he was on a, he was a guy who was on Love Island and then he ended up doing club nights and had a very successful business doing that. And then he went into to doing podcasting. And he, I would sit him like the young Jordan Peterson. And sometimes these questions are just, could you define that word for me? And then he stops back. Yeah. And I'm like, that person goes on for 20 minutes and elaborates further on a topic. And he's not really asked a question. He's asked just to define yeah. points. I just think that's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but then you will have you will you will have uh, guests that you really have to, to to pull on that thread. You have to tease it out. You have to ask the question. You might have to ask the same question in a different way. You might even have to just ask the same question again. Yeah. You know, if you if you want, you know, it's 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 just that balance, isn't it? And and I always say in the beginning, listen, look, I might have to ask you the same question over you know, a few times, not because you've done anything wrong, but like we just want a different version or, or, you know, you might say, you might answer in a slightly different way or whatever. So, you know, sometimes the right question doesn't get the right answer the first time and, and, you, and you can ask it again or you can reword it or whatever. And also you have to be careful not, you know, as you said, you know, you've got your points to refer to. A lot of the times things will be getting answered. Your questions will be getting answered regardless of whether you've asked it or not. Yeah. Um, so that's where the listening comes in that actually, you, you know, you've got the, and and that's, the, that's true of, of a good presenter. And it is, it is also true of a good director, you know, good, you know, the, the really good directors, you know, they know when they've got it. And, and even if, you know, you've you haven't asked half the questions that 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 you worked out. They go, no, we've got it. We've got enough. We've yeah. got this. We've got the. We've got what we need. That's great. Yeah. Or or they'll know. They'll go. Right, no, we asked. You know, they answered that question in that in that in the top of that. Or they da 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 da. Or they no fine. Or or yeah, we just need to maybe get a clearer sense of that. But yeah. apart from that, it's all good. So yeah, it's it's and that's where the listening is. You know, and and obviously in, in my job, I'm lucky that it's not only my ears there. You know, I've got maybe five, six, seven different pairs of ears, everyone listening and everybody, you know, you know, working collaboratively will to, 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 to do it. So, which is obviously not, you know, something that you don't have the luxury of, but, but yeah, I mean, I think you've, it looks like you're doing a great job. You know, you're, you're listening, you're referring to things that have been mentioned in your next question or whatever, and you're segueing nicely and stuff. So yeah, I mean, we're 60, 70, that sounds like a lot. That sounds like a lot of podcasts. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm just, I'm just generally very, very ballsy. I think about messaging a lot of people. Like since I started this a year ago, I haven't missed uh, a guest, a guest show on a Monday at any point, and I'm, I'm hoping and trying to keep that run going. I've had a few repeat, but um, I've never had a, an empty Monday where I didn't have anyone. So fingers crossed that continues. Um, but I, I, I find it such a fascinating medium, and just listening back to episodes, I'm, I'm one of those ones that. You can call it narcissistic if you like, but I quite like listening back to my episodes. One, because I, I I always hear something interesting and new from a guest that I didn't pick up that first time. But also, it's, it's and I'm sure you get this, especially if, the, if you ever do in live telly, there's things that are commonplace in normal conversation that are not commonplace when you're doing an interview. I remember the list of my first ever episode a few years ago, and I, I re -put, um, put it up uh, you know, when I started the show. And things like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, cool yeah 
that's normal in conversation. I didn't do that if I was meeting you in the street or in a pub. I'll be, I'll be a bit rude. But in a podcast, that's such a weird, annoying, jarring thing to listen to. The interview, I just go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So is there things like that you found that you're communicating, but your communicating style has had to change when you are in TV and particularly live TV? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the difference between being in vision and not. So I know you're listening to me, regardless of whether you're saying anything or not, because you're looking at me, you're 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 nodding, you're you're obviously engaged and, and you're there, you're present. I would imagine those things probably become more important if you if we couldn't see each other. You know, but, but I think it's just that, yeah, I mean I am here, I'm listening, I'm 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 there. Um so yeah, in telly, not you don't, I don't you you I think that the, the main difference between uh, having a conversation for the purposes of media and a normal conversation in the street is you just, you try and condense your questions. You know, you, we have a very, podcast is a beautiful medium that you, it's l- the longest form. So Which is rare these get, days with TikTok and things like that, right? It's a unique medium. It's, it's bucking the trend. You know, if you think now people want 10, 15 seconds max, you know, to sit and talk to talk to someone about something for 30 to, to you know, half an hour to an hour is, is pretty unheard of. Um, so so you, you don't need to worry too much about, you know, condensing everything. But in telly, you know, we're, we're always trying to just, you know, taking out any unnecessary words, you know, bring that, that that and sometimes you I have to do that. Sometimes I have to, I will ask the question in a in a fairly sort of laconic, you know, way, sort of as I'm finding my thought. And then I've and then I establish what it is I'm trying to get to at. And then you ask the question again in a very more punchy, tight, succinct way, which is more broadcast friendly so you know you will you, so you sort of you adapt the way you speak in that sense and with answers you know you, you try and keep them um as as sort of you know efficient as possible without being you know without being is a is trying to find that balance you know answering the question fully and and um at, at, but keeping it tight enough that that they can use it because you know we are condensing hundreds of hours into into an hour you know so it's every second counts you know we've we've so you're, you're more efficient but yeah no it, yeah apart from that i don't think there's too many differences in in having a conversation over a pint in in a pub and and, and in front of someone just with a with a camera and a, and a sound recorder mm. so transitioning onto the health stuff a little bit obviously you know we, we met on the food truth or scare show and you've done another show about red meat as well let's see this so i'll get i'll get interested to get your yep. thoughts on on that but Going through many series of food trees of scare, has it changed your opinion on certain things about what is considered healthy? Has your opinion on health changed during this show? Yeah, uh, yes and no. I think we know, you know, you know. I think you know deep down, don't you? The the basics, um, and it's an interesting one because health and nutrition are arguably two of the most complicated subjects out there. You know, they're they're up there with neurosurgery or or space exploration you know incredibly complex issues with lots of variables and then applying that to a a population is just i mean that it's it's almost infinite you know the 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 variations and the the differences are almost infinite that the way you might interact with something or I might interact and oh I think because you do that you're more likely to do that yeah but you haven't factored in this you know you can't you can't legislate for behavior you mm. can't you know and I love it when you eat like oh those eating yogurt were more likely to lose weight than the 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 it's like yeah but what other factors are involved in that like the person choosing yogurt for breakfast is already more obviously on that path it's got it might you know maybe it's got nothing to do with the yogurt you know mm-hmm. maybe it's got that the person the person that chooses yogurt for breakfast is is going to be much less likely to to choose fish and chips for lunch or or have a few pints or whatever like you know 
the the behavioral element of it is fascinating and you can't ever take that out like you can't even in studies you can't like even if you're trying to you can't let alone just going yeah no i think this but what i will say is no matter how complicated the subject the things that you need to apply are pretty simple you know the, yeah. the rules you should follow and the things you should try and do are fairly simple and we pretty much know them as well you know they're, they're not many of them would come as a massive surprise it's like you know it's like the computer you know like the computer engineer isn't it you know he's gone to university for four years and knows everything about computers his advice is turn it on and off you know um and it's the same for us with nutrition. It's like, you know, and, and I, I'm not a qualified dietitian or, or nutritionist, but there are some very simple, easily applicable, applicable rules that you that you if you follow, you will be healthier. That's yeah. it's as simple as that. You know, we want to be want to be sleeping as well as we can. We want to be exercising within whatever parameters of exercise you are okay with whether that's a walk whether that is a, a cycle whether that's a swim whether that's a, a hit session whether that's a crossfit session whether that's mountain climbing or just taking the stairs you know it you know it's whatever movement is right for you um drink a drink you know plenty of water try and cut down on the stuff that that's not great for you but also that you have to you have to take into consideration happiness as well. And, and that, that, that is a big part. You know, if you love a pint of beer and that makes you happy, actually maybe not having a pint of beer on a Friday is probably worse for your health than, than not having it, you know? Um, and it's, it's all about, you know, moderation, 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 a little of what you like is okay. You know, and being good enough most of the time is good enough as well. You know, if you want to have a, 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 a donut or a, or a pizza or whatever like do it but just try and be good most of the time you know try and have a balanced diet try and eat as much fruit and veg as you physically can not just because it will help me pay my mortgage but you know it is good for you um although i am slightly biased but yeah <laughs> i mean it's, it's fairly straightforward stuff I, I yeah i i think that's that's so true like with, with all the complexity there is around nutrition they, the the things I see in in you know, my coaching practice and is this is is twofold. There's one people try confusing health with trying to look like a men's or women's health cover model, and it's like they want this but they want to live just like a moderation healthy lifestyle, and and they go into the the intuitive eating thing of well you were intuitively eating before you started this, and as simple as it is, and it's, it's interesting you mentioned behaviour being the interesting factor here, like best example of this is any studies talking about the plant-based diets being healthier than than omnivore omnivorous diets and when you look at this that people that go plant-based tend to be more health conscious generally than the mm. people who eat meat that probably just going out big macs and burgers now if you equated the people who are on similar calories similar nutrient density would those results be different maybe probably it's hard to say but you know you're going to be you know deficient in various things but when i look at the things that slip people up when it comes to nutrition it's very much behavior things it's 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 oversights and the amount of calories they're having it's it's mistakes it's it's guilt around food it's not willing to own up to the things they don't want to admit and it, it's, it becomes so much more of a psychology game than it necessarily becomes a nutrient game because so many people know roughly what they should eat but it's, yeah. it's doing it that becomes a challenging thing yeah and sticking to it and that's why you know for me it needs to be small and sustainable changes. And sometimes we, so we go, we, you know, when eat well for less, we'll go and work with a family and say their favorite dinner is sausage and chips from a fish and chip shop, from a, from a chippy. Yeah. So it's deep fried sausage, deep fried chips, big portions. We say, right, that's your favorite meal. Well, how, how, and, and this is what I did with fake away actually, but we'll go on to that later maybe. But yeah. um, how do we take the fat? salt sugar calories out of that or how much can we take out but still retain that enjoyment and you could do it quite a lot you could come quite a way away from it actually you know uh, certainly when you're looking at deep fried versus like baked or whatever you know um and once you put your your condiments or your salt and vinegar on there or whatever actually maybe that maybe they could enjoy that meal as much 
and then, but then we get vilified, you know, by by certain parties, and they go, you know, you've just given them a, a, a you know, the same, you know, replaced a bad meal with a bad meal. It's like, yeah, but if I, if we said, look, you love deep fried sausage and chips, I'm going to give you kale, pine nuts, and and uh, you know, quinoa. They might do it for a, they might not do it at all. They might do yeah. it for a day. They might do it for a week. They might do it for a month. But that will not be giving them the satisfaction and enjoyment that they used to have. And, and that is not going to be sustainable. That's not going to last. So mm. we are better off. We are much better off going, I can pull 70% of the sat fat out of that meal. And I think you'll still enjoy it. Mm. And if that's the case, that's a win. Yes, of course, that still is, you know, you still wouldn't hold that up as a, this is the healthiest option but it's significantly healthier. And then where else can we do the same? And what, what else can we do to pull out those, you know, the unnecessary, the needless sat, fat, salt, sugar, calories, whatever, but still give you a, 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 a meal or a, a, a diet that you enjoy, that you can stick with. And that's the key, sustainable, small, sustainable changes. And, and if you don't see yourself, and this is why diets, you know, don't really work because if you don't see yourself doing it in two, three, four, five, ten years time, don't start. Like there is no point. Like there is no point in cutting something out of your diet that you can't cut out forever. Hmm. You have to learn to moderate. You have to look for alternatives. You have to look for substitutions. You have to look at reducing the volume or, or whatever, but it has to be sustainable. Otherwise, it doesn't work. It will work in the short term. And then you get into this yo-yo thing. And then, you know, and then that has a psychological impact. You know, people get demoralized and then they eat more. And then, da, 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 da. And then you see all these telltale signs start to, to, to come out. Um, so small, sustainable changes is always the way. It's interesting, the plant-based vegan um, diet. You know, I know, I know vegans with terrible diet. You know, you you know, the, the, and and the emergence in in you know plant based junk food is mm. extraordinary. You know, be, you know, there the, there is a whole industry now out there creating products, some of which are healthy, some of which are not. And we've got that, we've got a bit of a blind spot. The plant based must be healthier. That's not a plant is healthier, but 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 a but a plant based substitute. You know, junk food's junk food, regardless of, of whether it's plant based or not. Is it, you know, it's that's that. Um, so that yeah, that's an interesting space. And also, I think there's lots of confusion out there. In, I mean, I sort of feel more at peace with a crispy creme donut and a and a and a and a, and a full fat coke and a and a McDonald's than some other products out there because you can't go and have a Big Mac and not realize you're consuming a lot of calories and fat. You can't eat a Krispy Kreme donut and not realize you're consuming a lot of calories and sugar. You can't have a full, uh, you know, a Christmas red Coke and not realize there's a lot of sugar in it. Hmm. But some of these other products that are, you know, healthy or, you know, they look great or they're natural or they're this or they're that, and they've got added this and added that, you know, people are buying these products thinking they're, they're, they're healthier, they're, they're better for them. And, and in some ways there might be, but they also come with a lot of, that, of, of other things. Yeah. And, and people genuinely don't know. And that's the worry for me because I go, oh, I've just had a cereal bar. I'm probably still due a treat. No, that, yeah. that was your treat. Just because it wasn't a Krispy Kreme donut. Like, but you go, like, you go, if, you like, if you compare them like for like and go, there's as much sugar in that as there is in that. But if you ate that, you're not telling me you still just, you, you, you know, the, you know what you're doing. You're going to it with your eyes wide open. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's a, and, and what we've always got to understand is there is a billion, billion, billion pound business driving this, wanting us to, 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 to think certain things and buy certain things and act in a certain way. And that's fine, but we've just got to understand, you know, we've got to be aware. Um, and I think there's, we, you've got to apply a bit of cynicism. You know, there's got to be that inner cynic in you that just goes, right, it's telling me it's got 13 grams of protein. What's it not telling me? Yeah. Like, it's telling me, you know, well, it's great, it's great. Like, you know, in the same way that, you know, a, a, you know, a Krispy Kreme could probably say great source of energy. You know, yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> 
couldn't it? Like that's a that's a that's a perfectly plausible yeah. um, claim, isn't it? That the, the glucose, sugar, energy. But what's it not telling me? You know, like mm. and so you've got to let's just let's always have that slightly. I mean, don't you know, don't go around the shop. We are worried about everything, and, and you know, not everyone's out to get you and all of that. But go into everything with your eyes wide open and just you know, they're telling you something. What are they not telling you? You know, because yeah. they tell you what they want you to know. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing now I'm working primarily in the online space in terms of coaching and, and working with people from more countries, how the different level of understanding in certain places, you know, Australia, UK, USA, tend to be slightly more educated in terms of nutrition. Yet certain places in Europe, I work with a lot of guys from Serbia, and there's so much confusion around nutrition in these places of this food's good, this food's bad mentality, which creates, we talked about these yo-yoing and these, these unsustainable approaches. And I'm quite a big fan of, of, of some level of tracking your nutrition intake, whether that is full on tracking all your macros, my fitness pal, or whether that's put ham size portion control, or some level of understanding how much calories are in your food. Because what I want to take away from a lot of these guys is that thing of Snickers bars bad, this is good. I'm like, well, if you look at your Snickers bar, understanding that, like, before you think about all these fancy things and hormones and all this complication. If you want to lose a little bit of your weight, if you want to improve the majority of your health markers, being in a calorie deficit will help you in the short term. So when you look at this Snickers bar, it's 350 odd calories, and you can go, right, if I'm going to have that, and this is my day, I'm going to have to be this much hungrier to fit that into my day. Or, and then you decide, I don't want to be that much hungrier. I'm not going to have it. And you came to that choice. Or you go, yeah, it's worth it. I love a Snickers bar or I love a pie of beer or I love a Krispy Kreme. And th- it takes away this good and bad. It's just sort of like, it's it's like saying a holiday, buying a holiday or buying a Rolex is bad because I'm saving money. It's, none of these things are bad items. If you're budgeting, you just need to weigh yeah. out the pros and cons in that yeah. same approach. Um, one thing you mentioned in the book, which I thought was really interesting, is talking about, um, when you talk about adding a recipe book, it is, is the importance of a meal plan and creating that sort of structure in people's days and this is something like you know if you've ever seen any of my stuff i'm generally not a big fan of recipes Mm -hmm. and the reason i'm not a big fan of recipes is because i think it's the new year's resolutions approach to dieting it's like right i'm going to start a diet tomorrow i'm going to have a low carb high protein carbonara on monday and then i'm going to have a cauliflower pizza on tuesday and then i'm going to have this on wednesday i'm like you're going to keep that up for three days and it's going to be so much and it's going to be so overwhelming so what is your like what's your thoughts on getting people to enjoy cooking whilst keeping it simple enough for them to want to do it long term yeah so i i think i I agree with you i think if you were to go into a really prescriptive meal plan and and also tie that and connect that in with a diet it feels like that might become there's a, a lot to do all at once but for me a meal plan is is crucial in terms of of doing a few things it saves you money and saves you time and it and it reduces your food waste which also then feeds back into saving you money again so we do it like every household and it's probably happening you know what time is it now two o'clock in a in a in, a, in an hour or two millions of households up and down the country will be having the conversation what's for dinner i don't know what do you fancy i don't know what have we got i don't know i don't think we've got anything in right blah, 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 blah. then people go for the takeaway or or they're 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 you know they're having to root around or maybe they might have to go to the shops to get some whatever blah 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 so i advocate and we advocate on eat well for less you sit down with everybody that's going to be eating those meals in your house ideally Work out, and most people work on a fairly small rotor of meals anyway. Like if you really boil it down, most households would have a repertoire of 10, 15 meals. So, you know, you're not, you know, it's not an infinite thing. You know, oh, we like a chili, we like a spag bowl, we like a shepherd's pie, we like a roast dinner, we like uh, fajitas, we like... Uh, you know, whatever it might be, boom, 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 boom. You know, we might like Thai or this, that, and the other. Right, okay, cool. So you've got a relatively manageable repertoire anyway. So out of those meals that you know the whole family like and enjoy, let's just work it out. Okay, so Monday we're going to have this, Tuesday we're going to have that, Wednesday this, Wednesday that. If you, and, and I get that some people find that a bit, ah, I don't know what I'm going to eat, what I'm eat next Wednesday. Okay, that's fine, I get that. But actually, if I took, if I averaged it out, 
over your lifetime, I bet the same meal's coming up anyway. Like if I if, like if I just said like if we filmed you over the course of a two, three, four, five year period, I bet you're eating the same meals. Maybe not exactly on the same day, although I think invariably that would happen by default. But you would be eating the same cycle of meals anyway, regardless. So what you're doing now is just put in a day to it so you can go and do your shopping so create your meal plan leave a free day if you want friday we're going to go off piste we're going to freestyle it whatever like we're going to live we're going to be dangerous we're going to take you know we're not going to plan for a friday but plan for the majority of days and then write a list of the ingredients you need to make those meals and then that's your shopping list and then cross-reference your shopping list with what you've already got in your cupboards cross off you know i've got tin tomatoes i've already got pasta i've got this i've got that fine now you've got a net shopping list that's what you need to buy and if you go and buy those things only those things you will shop very more effectively efficiently and quicker and people say i haven't got time to plan the the time you waste not planning you know writing a meal plan will take you about five minutes you will win that five minutes back and more over the course of the week, you'll win it in the shopping trip alone because you're not wandering around going, well, what do you fancy? What should we get? What have we got? What? Da, da, da. You'll win it there and then you'll win it every day by not having that age old conversation and discussion of what's for dinner. What do you want? Da, 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 da. And basically what we're doing by not having a meal plan and not having those ingredients in to make those meals is you're basically subscribing by choice to a cooking competition every evening you know that's you know the rustle up challenge or the invention challenge or master chef you know that's ultimately what they do there's a load of stuff go and make something ah mm. oh, this is really hard but we're doing that in our yeah. home in our homes and by choice regularly so do yourself a favor get a meal plan and stick to it as much as you can but listen do your best that's like mm. i don't ever want you know i'm always mindful that with advice you know comes connotation and consequence and and I always think, listen, if if you just do your best, that's all you can do, and that's all I ever say. If you can meal, if you can't meal plan for seven days or five days, try a couple. Yeah. Try a couple. Do your best. Just you know, do what you can. I think I think there's two things that are really really important that you mentioned. I think I think it's interesting to look at about the same meals coming up on repeat. And I think there's a, there's a couple of connotations. So it's one of the things where people go into into mentality of dieting and making it harder for themselves than they need to be is if you took their diet they were having prior to starting the diet and you looked at how many meals they had it's probably a very like in one handful worth of meals and then all a lot of diets doing are placing it the same probably more variety just different meals but the yeah. mentality now is that i can't have that and it's, it's, yeah. it's almost like i can't have the things i want which is will transition nice into the book but i i, I also think as well when we're, when we're looking at a lot of people do with dieting they will sit there and go right I need to make this enjoyable. They're so worried about it that they're all of a sudden try and do 30, 40 recipes and they'll have 30, 40 different meals in the next seven days. Whereas if you pick, let's say, as you said, three to five you really like and do them on repeat until you're comfy and then add one. Yeah. Yeah. It just makes this far less an overwhelming procedure. But I think the other thing you mentioned there was, was you know, was good. It's just about taking away that sort of like decision fatigue with sort of stuff. Like we, we, we all have this tendency about, say, talking about saving time. How much time do we waste doing things? I get this with tracking food intake, where people go, um, it takes so long to track my food intake. I'm like, if you open your app every meal, you wait for it to load, you put the food in, you worry about what you have, you work out where you're going, you go into the supermarket, it's a massive task. Whereas if you spent five minutes at the end of the day just planning your next day's meals, or on a Sunday, plan your week ahead's meals, you don't have to think about that again. That's mental headspace you freed up for other things in yeah. your life. And it's the same as anything. The more you do it, the quicker it gets, doesn't it? You know, that's the same with cooking. That's the same with meal planning. That's the same as as all of these things. And and that, you know, if you were tracking something, you know, once you start to do it, it will just get quicker and quicker and easier and easier and easier. There are different kind of, you know, there are different thoughts in and around that, you know, area, whether some people, you know, the, whether it does help, where it doesn't, there's, you know, there's studies to to prove and disprove everything, isn't there? But um, but yeah, the more you do something, the easier and the quicker it gets for sure. Absolutely. And you're right, you know, just freeing up. It's like I always use the analogy, go to the gym. Like if I go to the gym for an hour, I could get the same results in half an hour, 100 percent, like 100 percent. Like I don't need to be there an hour. I could get I could I could do you know, I, I could work harder, smarter, more efficiently, more effectively, without a doubt, you know, and that's true of, of everything. That's true of the kitchen. That's true of the shop. That's true of the gym. That's true of everything. You know, it's just 
it's just trying to, you know, just, but just do it. The more you do it, the easier it gets. Hmm. So going, going into the book, I mean, I, I, I've, I've, sp- I've known a few people have embarked on writing books and they say it's the, the hardest thing they've ever done. This is your second book now. And the, <laughs> so like, I can't imagine how tricky it is to write a recipe book and come up with however many original recipes. Like, what was the thought process going on to this book? Why have you chosen the fake away method? And how, how did you actually piece this together? So it is quite a task to write a book. The first book I, well, first of all, it was my first one. And second of all, it was just a more of an everyday sort of good food sorted every day. So then I really struggled because it was, what do I put in there? Like, you know, okay, you need this amount of meat, this amount of fish, this meat, veggies, you need some breakfast, you need some lunches. You need so that was my sort of framework which is fairly, you know, ex- you know, endless. So that I sort of struggled with that, um, but really loved it, really enjoyed it. Um, but with Fake Away, it was really easy because the premise behind Fake Away is we are a nation of takeaway lovers. Uh, takeaways are expensive. They're not all unhealthy, but let's face it, lots of them are. You know, they can be high in fat, salt, sugar, calories, um, but we love them. And I thought, how much of those calories, sat, fat, salt, sugar, can I take out with you still, but with the, with that meal, with that recipe, still delivering the flavor and the enjoyment that you want. And actually the answer is quite a lot. It is quite a lot, but then what that gave me, well, that would give me a fabulous fr- framework. So I've gone through takeaway outlets. So, uh, you know, I've, you've got your, your, your curry takeaway, You've got your, your your Japanese, you know, takeaway restaurant. You've got your fish and chip shop. You've got your burger bar diner style. Um, you've got your Chinese. And so then I just went, right, what are the most popular Japanese takeaways? What are the most popular Indian takeaways? What are the most popular Chinese takeaways? What are the most popular things from a fish and chip shop? And, and, and. And then, and it was basically reverse engineering. So you just, you, 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 right what's in that right okay how much of that can i take it what does it need the ghee does it does it need the butter does it need you know okay that that requires it to be deep fried can i get the same result baking can i get the same result shallow frying can i get the same result without using batter but using breadcrumb boom, 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 boom. and just so just it was actually the easiest it was like a it was almost scientific it wasn't creative it was the opposite of creative in a, in a way actually is I was deconstructing. Mm. Um, so that was fascinating. And it really, really, really great. And it was just, you know, some things I couldn't do. You know, some things, you know, you, you, you the healthier version didn't quite cut it. And so you then, you're like, okay, so I, I just won't do that. But loads, loads of the recipes, actually, you can take out so much mm. and, and still enjoy it. And also, interestingly as well, and I'll tell you another just very quick anecdote, is how much your taste buds change. So I did a program called Tomorrow's Food, and I, they were, they wanted me to take uh, meal replacement tablets, uh, meal supplements. And this is uh, like, how are we going to feed a growing population with less resources and all of that? So one of the ideas, one of the scientific um, discoveries was a tablet, basically. It gives you all your nutrition, calories, da da da, da. So I was supposed to take these for, for a month and, and you shouldn't gain weight, you shouldn't lose weight. It should keep you like, you know, where you are. Yeah. Um, and I was getting, uh, at that time, I was, I was, you know, working a lot, busy, early mornings, and I was drinking strong but milky coffees with two sugars and probably having five a day maybe maybe even more four five six a day two sugars milk and they said look we don't want you to have that because that's obviously sugar and the milk and you know that will affect the result but we don't want you to have caffeine withdrawal so you can have black coffee Mm. the first time i drank a black coffee it was like medicine it was un it was disgusting it was disgusting and I thought, there's no way I could drink that. But within two or three days, that was the coffee that I now drank and enjoyed. And if you gave me, and we're talking in a small time frame, and if you gave me my old coffee back, that would be as undrinkable as that black coffee was in the beginning. Yeah. So even if something, you know, even if you want your deep fried fish and chips or your saveloy or, or your, you know, your thing, if you have a slightly healthier version a couple of times, uh, that will be the new 
that would be the new standard. That's the new benchmark. And if you had the old one, like I like a cooked breakfast, love a cooked breakfast. You know, very rarely, very, very rarely now. But if, if, if you know, when I can, it, 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 I, I enjoy it. But I can't have it all fried now. You know, it, 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 it's all like, you know, cooked in the oven or on the grill or whatever, you know. And I couldn't have a proper fried breakfast now. Like that would be like, so greasy and oily and unpleasant, you know. But it's so it just it's about just changing the dial little by little and your taste buds will adapt your taste buds will change and then and then you won't want to go back even if like you think that i could never not love this you'd be surprised yeah and that that's you when you're looking at finding the middle ground and the balancing act it's, it's the same thing when you're looking at someone trying to get healthier and lose weight you said earlier about how having a such a massive removal um certainly if you don't have a deadline from from what they were doing before might be too hard to follow but at the same time we often see people are going into too far down the sustainable route of like well i'll just have some cookies because i want it to be sustainable and they just start sneaking in three four five six a week and i always have this conversation with clients like what you think is sustainable now will not be what you want to be sustainable 10 yeah. 12 20 weeks down the line i go right like let's let's look at building some habits now let's get you better relationship with food let's get you aware of how many calories are in your food let's get you cooking some food again and then you get to the end of you know whatever time frame they they have for coaching and go right what do you want back i'd love a beer but you might go oh i used to have a dessert every day i don't fancy that anymore and like okay cool yeah. that's now not something you actually want anymore and so, and sustain your taste buds as you say have have sort of changed so going into the just finishing off a little bit talking about you know, the book, one of the things I think was really, really important you mentioned here was the importance of teaching kids to cook. Um, so like for people out there, and I, I don't, I don't have children, people out there who maybe rely on takeaways too much. And, you know, we spoke about earlier about time management and all the, you know, kids will take away a lot of that time. We spoke about that at the start. What advice would you give to a family wanting to start to make cooking a family action? And what skills do you feel like everyone should learn to be a better cook for themselves to be healthier or for their kids to learn? in life yeah okay it's a great question um i think there's loads that you could do i think the, the 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 main thing is make it fun make it fun and especially with fake away say for example or or you know trying to replace that takeaway with a home cooked look let, let's face it like you're not gonna you know if, they, if they're used to getting a, a happy meal or, or whatever from from a certain place you're going to struggle to replicate that Exactly. But what you can do is you can make a very good, healthier version of burger and chips, but make it fun, like wrap up a little toy. You know, it doesn't need to be a new toy. It could be something you've already got. You know, maybe, you know, find a way of of like what I do is with 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 my kids is is I make them like a like a cocktail thing. Like it's not a cocktail. It's basically just a like a glass of squash. But you put an umbrella in there and a straw <laughs> and a thing. And suddenly like this is magic. This is like a this is an event where like. It's like we're at a restaurant. We're not. We're just at home. But and I've just you know, and you might put out like a fun serviette, or you know, you can get different containers for things. You know, you can get little boxes or or chip um, wrappers and, and make it fun. Uh, give it that sense of event. Get them involved in the kitchen as much as possible. In terms of what sort of skills, I mean, obviously chopping is is important, but it's the thing that that people are, 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 are the, you know nervous about doing within re, you know and with reason you know you have to be careful kids and knives you know for sure um but weighing out getting the measuring in there's so many things they can do um but just get them involved it is messier like th- there is no dressing that up getting the kids in the kitchen is messier um but it's the greatest lesson you can give them you know uh, uh, you know if you think about some of the things we teach them you know, we teach them algebra, we teach them you know, all sorts of different things, you know. How often are they going to use that? How how applicable is that in the real world? But you teach them to cook and give them a good understanding of, you know, basic understanding of nutrition. They'll be able to feed themselves and their family every single day for the rest of their lives and then pass that on as well. So it's the, arguably the most valuable thing we could ever give our, our children. Um make it fun i i love communal eating that's the, the my favorite thing i think that's really important for lots of reasons you know and that's you know i think that whole plating someone's pl- food up like first of all portion thing the psychology of that with kids is 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 interesting it becomes you is it's, it could be insurmountable for them it could be overwhelming so what i do is we have bowls and dishes and plates in the middle and it's help yourself 
you know, and that can apply to lots of, of loads and loads and loads of recipes. And that does a couple of things, actually. What kids will eat and what they won't eat partly is down to control. They don't have a lot of control in their life, children. So mm-hmm. what they eat is, is one area where they can exert some control. So you're giving that control back. You're saying, yeah. look, I don't want you to eat everything, but just try some stuff. You know, that is, it's, it's, uh, it's engaging. It's, it's informal. It's, it's interactive. I think it makes so much sense. Plus anything that isn't eaten is untouched, therefore can be made into something else the next day or utilized it as, as leftovers. You know, you're not, you know, it, it's not covered in ketchup or half eaten or someone's plate. So, um, communal eating is is a great way for me uh of doing it and uh yeah just just make it fun and get them involved in the meal planning as well because that gives you the you know if they go they come home from school go oh god i don't want cottage pie tonight it's like well you were there when we agreed it so what do you want like you've had an input in this um so yeah get them involved in the planning get them involved in the cooking as much as possible and just try try and make it fun try and make it informal try and yeah try and make it yeah interactive I think there's so, so many important lessons with that, right? From, from like kids being able to weigh out portion sizes and understand, you know, tune into their own hunger signals, which will help them be healthier down the line as well. To, as you said, giving, I thought it was very interesting to like getting, you know, having kids control their food where a lot of kids are very picky eaters. And I don't know if your kids are, but I can imagine less so. Um, yeah, they have their moments, of course, like all kids, kids are kids, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and we're not the, you know, no one's, no one's perfect, but, but by giving them that, you know, you'd be surprised. I promise you, if you've got fussy eaters in your house, I promise you by giving them that control back, they will put things on their plate. You will be surprised by, I mm-hmm. promise you. Yeah. And I can imagine as well with the communal eating idea as well in a world where everyone's going to be attached to their phones, having something where it's a bit, it's a bit of family time. They, they, they start planning it together. It, 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 as you said, it becomes it becomes fun and it just allows people to be. I always I always find it's a weird thing with podcasts. Podcasts always come full circle. And I'm going to bring the word present back that you mentioned right at the start of this, which is you know it's a great thing. So I think that's a huge lesson. So just two closing questions to finish off for let you get on with your day. I know how busy you must be. Um, we, you ha- you've researched all these different cuisines to put together this great and amazing amount of recipes that are in the fake way book. Um, what is your favorite cuisine of food? Middle Eastern, I think. Ooh, I mean, why, why so? I wouldn't have thought you would have said that. So it, it works into that sharing, that feasting, that meze, the, the, you know, the, a bit of everything. I love my food. I'm quite greedy. So I don't want to eat one thing. I want to have a mixture of everything, you know, it's i i love middle eastern food you know the 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 breads the hummus the you know the salads the grilled meats just really simple flavorful food um with that sense of of you know communal eating and sharing and stuff like the meze yeah that's that's probably up there with my favorite one of my favorite things is a kebab like i love it is they're demonized they're demonized but the shish kebab is like the healthiest thing. You know, you're talking about grilled meat with raw veg. Like it's delicious <laughs> and like properly healthy. Like, yeah. but, but but someone would go like, if you walked out of a kebab shop, someone would go, whoa, what are you playing out there? They've got their sandwich, you know, their pre-made sandwich, thinking that they're, they're, theirs is a better choice. Actually, you know, grilled meat, if you eat meat, and, and you know, raw cabbage and, and, and veg, you know, bit of chili sauce. That's, you know, I, I love that. But, um, I think, yeah, I mean, we eat a lot of Japanese and Thai now mm. as a family. Um, the katsu curry is, is probably you know, like a like a mainstay in our, in our house. Um, the, the, the tikka masala is a real popular. So I, with big flavors, just food with big flavors. But I think one cuisine and obviously Italian Mediterranean is, is, yeah. is a mega, isn't it? But um but yeah, I would say my my personal favorite is Middle Eastern, like a big tabula, you know, like loads of fresh yeah. herbs and ah, delicious. <laughs> so, uh, last question before we finish on finding out where you are. If someone going back to the start of this episode, if someone was looking to, in a way, follow in your footsteps, get themselves involved in TV, like how would you advise someone to get started? Cry, wow, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't even know to be honest. I mean, I think probably the best thing that you will find out why you want to do it what is it you're trying to get from it first of all um and then go into it with your eyes wide open because you know not everything is is as as seems and don't i think i think what we've got to be careful of is you don't chase the end result 
you mm. sort of need to be aware of where you want to go, but that can't be the only thing because first of all, that might change. That might not happen. That that might not be right for you even. So you've got to, and I know this sounds a bit, you know, a bit of a cop out, but you've got to enjoy the journey. Like, otherwise you can't, you can't just think, oh, if I, if I was to get a chain of gyms, I'd be happy. Okay, great. Maybe you would. Maybe that is what you want. Maybe that is what you will get, but you've got to enjoy working in one. Mm. You've got to enjoy all the elements of it because that you're because you're not you, you don't go from A to Z. You know, there is B, C, D, E, F, G, and you've got to enjoy every element of that, or certainly enjoy parts of it. Mm. So I, I yeah, I wouldn't fixate too much, but there's great, you know, I mean, social media is a great platform. It's there's challenges with it, of course. I, I you know. But in terms of answering your question, if you wanted to to to, to get a profile or to have a, a platform, you know, YouTube, social media, podcasts, all of these things, you could start to do those uh, the other mediums. Um, but it would, I would imagine, it would be slightly more dependent on what you want, what element do you want, yeah. and then look around and see who does it, like who's your peers, who who's doing a good job in that area, what you like about them, maybe even reach out to advice, you know, because obviously you know, news readers would follow a slightly different path to someone that wanted to be into enter, into in entertainment or, or, or fact in or whatever. So just, yeah, maybe, maybe reach out to a few people. You could, you could speak to production companies, maybe speak to agents, talent agents, you know, there's loads of different ways, but, but it's a very broad area and, and you would probably want to hone into an area that's more specific to, to what you want. But, but I think just as a general rule of thumb, don't always focus only on the end. You've got to enjoy the the, the 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 stages to get there. And the more you enjoy anything, and this is what I say to the kids, it doesn't matter what you do. If you enjoy it and you do your best, you will be successful. You mm-hmm. will be okay. I think that's a, that's a good bit of advice for, for anyone in any endeavor. So where can where can people find you? And also where can people buy the book? So I think the book is available in most bookstores. It's also available online. So just Google Chris Bavin Fake Away. Uh, follow me on social media. I'm on. Uh, I'm not very good at it, and I'm not like <laughs> prominent, but um, I'm on Instagram, and it that is, I think it's just Chris dot Bavin, and on Twitter, I think it's Chris at Chris underscore Bavin. Uh, yeah, I got lots of people. I always try and reply to all messages, um, and if you, anyone's got any questions or anything, you know, feel free to to ask. Well, thank you very much, man. It's been a really, really good conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. No, you're brilliant. Yeah, I think you're really good. You've got a, a great a great way about it. I've done a lot of podcasts on this side. Um, and yeah, you do, you do a really good job. So yeah, well done. Appreciate that. Thank you very much.